Salutations to fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and I would like to use the androgynous sounds of my voice to share with you a few words about the lessons learned from my year in smut. Lesson number one, I write smut is one hell of an icebreaker. While I am not the anti-socialite that I was when I first started writing, there are still a lot of social situations at which I find myself hopeless. However, over the last year, it has not mattered whether the folks to whom I am talking do customer service for a living, do jousting for a living, happen to work in customer service, or happen to work at haunted houses. If it comes up in casual conversation that I have been conscripted by my publisher to ghostwrite naughty stories containing one or more fantasy twists, the universal response has been, go on. So that's a touch of serendipity that I could not have predicted. Lesson number two, still not rich. I think if one has been writing unsuccessfully in a genre for a while, the temptation is to blame the genre. Like, the genre fiction writers think that the real money is in literary fiction. The literary crowd thinks that the real money is in general fiction. The general fiction crowd thinks that the money is in nonfiction. And the nonfiction writers know money is a made-up concept, engineered by a few delusional fiction writers. And while I am a fan of trying a variety of genres, if one is rubbish at networking, effective communication with your graphics people, pitch writing, and assorted other activities that require you to play nice with others. A change of genre probably won't help as much as you think. Lesson number three, few things bring out the faults of a genre like smutifying that genre. Weirdly, the older a fairy tale beastie gets, the less sacred it becomes. For example, stories about the winged pegasus have been around since before the Ten Commandments. So just by sheer volume of stories that have been written about them over the years, it would take a concentrated effort to write the worst one ever. Whereas, if I take it upon myself to write about the Draconiquus, that is a critter that sounds old, but the oldest reference to it I could find was in Dungeons and Dragons, and the second oldest in My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. So if I write a story about a Draconiquus, I might run into unexpected copyright issues. Elsewhere in Fantasyland, there are beasties that are hypothetically fair game, but are so entwined with one author or another that it's actually kind of hard to extract them and let them breathe on their own. Like if I write dwarfs into my fantasy romance, I have to solve a couple of problems, like how do I get a satisfying story between two and 10,000 words with a fantasy creature that is used to having free reign in 200,000 words or more. Absolutely doable, but it is done so seldom that I didn't necessarily have a model for that. Lesson number four, some boundaries are flimsier than you think. At the start of this project, there were some rules that remain pretty inflexible to this day. Consent is still huge, empowerment is still huge, as well as the writing of a story which would hopefully be worth reading even if the sex scenes were removed. But at the start of this year-long project, there were things I could not picture myself doing, not because I had a moral objection, but because I didn't think I could do a good job. I did not, for example, foresee myself writing a sapphic romance, but for whatever reason, I had a couple of strong females volunteer to be in a story together, and it ended up being the publisher's favorite story in the collection. So we try things. Sometimes they turn out like garbage, but if you stack the garbage high enough, you can absolutely get a better vantage point than what you had before. Lesson number five, can't please everyone. Admittedly, the stories I've written for Icy London I have written backwards. I have not structured the story around a kick-ass sex scene. I have attempted to write worthwhile stories and then fit the sex scene wherever I could. Over the summer, I ended up chatting with the publisher's most prolific cover artist about my plans for incorporating a lich into a naughty book. And he got an attitude with me. He said, you don't want to write smut. You just want to write a good story. I mean, does it show? And that kind of storytelling is not going to be for everyone. A lot of folks come to this genre specifically to become a satisfied customer with as little story as possible. And that's fine. As with any genre, sometimes there are perfectly good readers and perfectly good writers that just won't gel with one another. I'm at peace with this. I'd be at greater peace with it if I could pin down my target audience. But the truth of the matter is, nothing I write is ever going to please everyone. And that is really and truly fine. Lesson number six, smut commandeers your brain. It was actually fairly early on in the Great Smut Experiment that I found myself thinking of all fairy tale beasties like a home brewer thinks of the great outdoors. What's that? That's Queen Anne's Lace. Let's make a booze out of it! And it is not my preference to do that, because every one of these lore-born creatures was somebody's first love in fantasy. So believe it or not, it has been my goal to write all of these stories with as much respect to the lore as is interesting. And lesson number seven. If I start a story, I can usually finish it. Over the past year, the goal was to get at least one naughty story done per month. I didn't quite make it. I ended up with 11 stories in 13 months. But part of how I did that is I took notes on my phone, 
when a new title or a line of dialogue would occur to me. And I would lose interest or I'd get busy and come back to it and think, you know, that's not too bad. What can we do with this? In the case of The Mermaid, I had the file on my phone for six months and was convinced that I wasn't going to do anything with it. So I got on my phone and I was clearing out space and I was reasonably sure that all I had was the title. The title was Manhandled by a Mermaid. So I go into the file, make sure that I don't have anything worthwhile in this sucker. And I see four words of dialogue. And those four words were, I'm hallucinating. I'm Meredith. And I look down at my phone and I hear past tense me snicker. And I go, you ass. Would it have killed you to finish this story? Cause I want to read it. And I can't read it unless I write it. But past tense me was right. I had no clue how to finish that story at the time that I took those notes. But because past tense me had an idea and wrote it down, I now have a story with mermaids and machine guns. Isn't the creative process fun? I think it's fun. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. I post whenever I can. This video is brought to you compliments of the Alert Everyone That I See London Has a New Book Foundation. If you want to let my publisher know that you would like this project to continue, please consider purchasing this very silly book. It might be worth some giggles to you. Until we meet again, take it easy. Loves you.